Shabbat Shalom and welcome to STI Suomi Tora International Torah Portion Discussion by Yikra. Take it away, boys. <laughs> well, Shabbat Shalom, Shalom, Shalom everyone. everyone. And it's great to be here. Um, and my, I guess he's going to be the co-host. Well, actually, he's going to be the host and I'm going to co is James Carruthers. How are you, James, and everyone else? Doing wonderful. Just so glad to have this beautiful, sunny Shabbat day after a night of storms. And of course, we're just enjoying the rest that the Father provides and the blessings that come with honoring that day, that set-apart time. We know it's a sign between him and us, him and his children. And so what a special unique thing that we can choose to do. We don't have to choose it, but uh, many of us that participate in the Shabbat, we know what a wonderful time and how many blessings come from that specific time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know we talk about it all the time, but in Jubilees, uh, it says that uh, the Shabbat is kept in the heavens and I think it's an honor to be able to actually participate with Yah and the angels in heaven on this day, you know. It so. truly is. That was eye-opening when we were introduced to some of these books, especially Jubilees, and to realize that they are as well participating in this time. I mean, who wouldn't want to participate and be a part of that? It's if we make it into the his gates one day, we're going to be doing it there. So why wouldn't we do it here as well? Exactly. Well, yeah, if, the, if yeah. everything, if all of our um, feast days and everything was a shadow picture of what was to come, then isn't that what the, the Shabbat is too? It's a shadow picture of the Shabbat to come, right? What a, what a really way is. to look at it. So. All right. Well, James, you're the you actually uh, know where we're at here in uh, Leviticus, and uh, so uh, go ahead and and take it away. I guess if you want to start. Sure. Yeah. So we are going to be going through Vaikra, which is the beginning of Leviticus, chapter one, and the portion that we had, depending on the translation is probably going to be through chapter 6, verse 7. And this portion really focuses on the different sacrifices, the offerings that the high priest give up for the atonement of our sins. Uh, we actually find out that there's various different offerings given place. And I'll go through some of those as well. I've got some notes on that. But uh, to start off with, Lee actually had kind of looked into the name Leviticus in Hebrew, trying to pick it apart with the pictograph. And by using the first three letters of Leviticus, L-E-V, out of Strong's H-3820, it's a Lamed and a Bet. And so with that pictograph, obviously we know the Lamed is a picture of the shepherd's staff that represents authority. And the bet is a picture of a tent representing what's inside of that. So when you combine those two, you get the meaning of authority inside or ruler of the house. And we know that we also, Yah is dwelling in the tabernacle at this time. He's also uh, the cloud and the, the pillar of fire dwelling over the tabernacle. There's a verse here I was going to share. Let me see if I can find it. And while you're looking for that, you know, one of the first things that I noticed here in uh, in Leviticus 1 is how when they bring the animal, whether it's a bull or a goat or a lamb, um, they're to be un unblemished, right? They're to, mm -hmm. to be kind of the the prize of your herd, so to speak, you know, and, and uh, I've I've been around livestock my whole life, and every year you always have that one or two critters that just 
they're above and beyond. They always shine more. They're just, they're, they're the perfect ones. And that's, those are the ones he wants us to bring. That's what he wants us now to present to him, right? In, in, in right. our walk is to do the best that we can. And interestingly enough, just a couple of weeks ago in our, uh, another Shabbat study, uh, we went through Ephesians 527, which was spot, wrinkle, and blemish, right? And, and, and uh, Yahusha was the unblemished lamb sacrificed for us, right? Because we are full of wrinkles. You know, it's, it's, it's really amazing when you, when we dug into that, how, how his, his blood covers us and makes us without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and so I just, I find that interesting how, He's, he uses all of this from the very beginning to present to us today what and how we're supposed to present ourselves before him. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing just to think about how much bloodshed there was with all the sacrifices, all the animals. I mean, I can't imagine how much blood was shed to atone for their sins and then to realize that none of that even compared to the one Messiah that we have, you know, his blood made up for all of that. And it's just an amazing thing to ponder on. And what a blessing it is that we don't have to perform those offerings. Now we our living bodies are that offering that we can give up a pleasing offering to him in various ways, but mm -hmm. truly is a beautiful yeah. image. Go ahead, Lois. You had something to share? Well, no, I just wanted to ask a question. Because this is in the first month of, uh, of the se um, the second, first day of the first, second month of the of the second year, if I remember right, is this the first blood offerings? I mean, I there, there has been, but I, my, my kind of following, what I'm trying to figure out is, I think this is when they institute sacrifices, correct? Or not? Am I wrong? In, in Leviticus here, you mean, this is, this is when Aaron, this is, I, if I understand your question correctly, this is where the very beginning of this begins. That's what you're saying. That's what and I'm I saying. Think that is with Aaron and stuff being the high priest. That was the beginning. Yeah. That's, that's where the altar, that's where the, the blood, of course, before this, I think Moshe took the blood in the hyssop and, and sprinkled it on the people and on the so there was that but this i think if if i'm correct others here probably have a better answer than i do but i think you're right well it does state that before this time there were seven that offered up offerings the righteous ones uh and i've got a list of them here yeah starting with adam Yep. And then right. Abel, Noah, mm -hmm. Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, and then Moshe. <clears throat> now, they offered those up, but at a, as an institutional thing, I guess, is, I, mm -hmm. is what I thought Lois was referring to. Because yeah, you're I'm right still... in Jubilees, too, when 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 uh, Moa's, uh, Noah comes off the ark, the first thing he does is make an atonement for the earth, right? Right. Yep. So. Yeah, I, I knew there were other offerings or sacrifices, but as a, a group of people where they were told to do this, this is the first we see of that command of bringing sacrifices and offerings for sins and things like that. This is the first, at least what I was, they, there was like atonements made, like you said, but this is where we see the whole community participating and being active in this, was just my thought. Yeah, definitely. There's we see through this portion <clears throat> that there are five various types of offerings. <clears throat> Excuse me. You've got the ascending offering, and this was a free will sacrifice that was consumed entirely by the fire on the altar. You've also got the meal offering, an offering of the flour. And this was usually an unbaked offering similar to unleavened bread 
and then the peace offering. And this was eaten by the one bringing it to give a way of expressing thanks to Yahuwah on joyous occasions. You also have the sin offering to make atonement for certain sins committed unintentionally by an individual for the entire community. And then the guilt offering, it was required as part of the penitence required for certain improper acts. And I like how it states that there are really only three various animals their kosher animals can be given up as an offering the oxen the sheep or ram and then the goat and then of course you have the turtle doves and pigeons if you were unable to give of the first and then even the poor person could give a grain offering if they were unable to give an animal Jerry, but let's. You got yeah. something to add there? No. Yes. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought you were trying to look. So yeah, I think it's also uh, interesting. The ascending smoke offering, like you said, was a free will offering, and that's what our prayers are now. Our prayers are the ascended smoke offering today, right? Mm -hmm. So that's free will. When when we're worshiping and praying to Him and stuff, that's free will to Him. He doesn't demand it of us, but you know. That's that's the aroma that he wants to to smell, I guess, to be in uh, uh, communication with us, to to get to know us, because that's that intimacy. I think is so important in our relationship with him. So it is. Yeah, I'll share a verse out of First Samuel fifteen twenty two, and Shimiel said, "Has Yahweh as great delight?" in ascending smoke offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of Yahuwah. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And it just shows that he didn't want these sacrifices. He, you know, if he had a choice, he wouldn't have gone that route, but it was needed. But he wants our obedience more than anything. That, in a way, is our sacrifice that we can give to him, our offering. Absolutely, and that's what it says in Matthew. Um, I think it's 9 and chapter 13, the first instance, he says, go and see what it means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And the second time he said, had you gone and found out what that meant, right? So it's, mm -hmm. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Yeah, it's it's absolute. So, I'm sorry, I'll stop button in now. I'm... No, anyone, please share anything. I love getting insight from different perspectives and please raise your hand. <laughs> These are all sin offerings, are they not? So this is not the first time that they're that that we're that, that the people, the believers, the followers are are required to bring an offering because they sinned is this the beginning of sin offerings because blood is always an atonement for sin so but if you were poor you could bring grain but the way i'm look and thinking I, I was trying to find it the first mention is in verse is in chapter four uh, where the it's a sin offering of ignorance and you had said the one where they didn't know like and so i went these are the first this is the first time we as human beings or them as human beings were required to acknowledge their sin and make them and make a, and lose something maybe for it. Is that a way to put it? You know, I mean, they had to give up something. No, yeah, could be, I guess I haven't. I, yeah, haven't heard of awesome. yeah. I know. I mean, in starting in the very beginning, Leviticus one, one, it says, and Yahuwah called unto Moshe, and spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the assembly, saying, So sin separates between us and Yah. You know, we have been separated, and we can see that because of that golden calf incident, that Yah did not directly speak with him any longer. 
that he dwelt from the tabernacle or outside of the tabernacle. And so that separation occurs. Let's see. And then in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of Elohim. But sin has caused us to fall away from his presence. Yahweh made a way back to him by sending his Yahid, Yahusha, the perfect lamb, and our last sacrifice. And that's so wonderful. Yeah, sometimes I think it's hard for us to really even comprehend uh, uh, John three sixteen. Right? We it's it's hard for us to wrap our head around the fact that that Yah actually sent His one and only Son, His Yahid, into the world. That we, you know, and it says, you know, in in First John, while we were yet sinners, He yet died for us. He died for us while we were still, and we're still sinners. And he died for us, right? And so this idea, this concept is, to a certain extent, is, is foreign. But at the same time, it's it's so much bigger, I think, than we can actually comprehend in our, in our human mind what actually took place to, to actually turn your face when your child is dying. You know, when we think of what they just went through a year before, I believe it would be Passover, they didn't, I don't think they saw the symbology of the, that would, they all were committed, I just thought, I thought about it, they all had to kill a lamb at that point, too. And that was, I think, like you said, like pointing toward Yahusha when he when he dies on the cross, but they wouldn't have saw it, but it would make an mm -hmm. atonement. It covered them from the death that was going to come through. And so Yahusha's blood covers us from the death we so deserve, but he doesn't give it mm -hmm. to us. He takes it. And that to me is amazing because it's like a year later because they're going to go into Passover, I think. I wish I knew my scriptures, the history, the the, the timeline way, way better but um, anyways, that was what just crossed my mind when you said that. I thought, yeah, they, they just did it in, in Passover. And they wandered and they did 50, 50 days of walking or 54, I formed what I could tell, three or four, until they actually got to where they were going. And then they enter into the promised land and they do this. And it's like, wow. Anyways. Yes, yeah, so, such amazing. It's like a full circle. And. I'm just amazed that the truth just it doesn't always stick out to you until you're ready to see it. You know, growing up in church, very familiar with all these different stories, and but you never saw that connection. I personally didn't necessarily see Messiah in the Old Testament, but he's just about in every chapter of every book. And it's so incredible to have that connection in it. I'm just so blessed to finally see the truth in a, a much different way. I love this verse out of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of Elohim, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Elohim, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. You know, and obviously there's only one perfect man that will ever have lived, and he gave his life. He was the living sacrifice. So, you know, as an example, we need to be living like him, even if it does cost us our life, we need to be willing to give that up for the glory of Yah.
is our reasonable service. Yeah. I'm I'm just so excited for Passover. It's it's always been ever since we started, it's been an eventful time. Our first year we had it here at my home and out of nowhere in the middle of our meal the most intense hailstorm just came out of nowhere and caused damage, flooded our roads. It was very unexpected. We didn't get any kind of alert. And actually looking at the radar on my phone, it was just a tiny purple dot right over my location. There nowhere else was there even a storm. And we thought, wow, this must be Hasatan trying to stop us because we had finally come out of the pagan traditions and was celebrating his feast days. Uh, but the more I think of it, I think it was just Yah showing us his majesty and his power um, because he is the creation. He created it all. And just because it can be violent and dangerous doesn't mean it's it's a bad thing. And it's beautiful in its own way. You just have to look at it in a different mindset. And then the following Passover... Eileen can attest to this. We were camping out on a lake and we were going to be rebaptized that Passover morning. And the evening before a tornado passed over us and we're here, we are camping in tents. Um, and I just, I can remember me and Lee, we pulled out the Sefer and we just started reading the scripture and it got to the point where it was so loud, we were having to yell it out because the rain and everything was so loud. And, you know, we didn't necessarily even know what was around us. We could obviously tell it was coming and it was pretty intense outside, but we didn't even bother looking out. And for being in that situation, I've never felt such calm and shalom. And it was because we were focusing on the word. We were calling out to him. We were reading his scriptures and it was a, a beautiful thing even though you would think it would be quite terrifying it was a a very calming sense that came over both of us and so he does calm the storms in all facets yes he does he does yeah you know and and when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in him Right. As Job said, though he slay me, still I will worship him. Right. And and mm. that's I I I pray that that's all our attitude. It's sometimes so much easier to say than actually do, right? I mean, but yeah. So if we can learn to praise him through our pain, right, then we will find shalom in that. Absolutely. So what other nuggets did you dig up in there? And someone else, anyone else has anything they want to share? Why, please, please jump in there. We're kind of just uh, going through, starting in Leviticus one here, I guess. So, and and on. So, I've got a few other scriptures I can share here. In Romans 6, well, first, let me say this. So, Yahushua was the offering. He was the gift of life for our sin. He was made manifest to put away our sin, coming in the flesh as our last sacrifice. In Romans 6, starting in 15, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law? But under grace, never know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey his servants, ye are whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto unrighteousness. I'm sorry, unto righteousness. But Elohim be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. 
And that word righteousness has been popping up a lot lately in my life. And I want to just dig into it more and get a deeper understanding of it. I know we're doing a little mini series on Thursday evening right now, connecting the seven days of creation to the seven trumpets of revelation and trying to find the connection and similarities between that. And in Isaiah, it mentions how the heavens will open and righteousness will pour down, you know, and in my mind, I'm seeing the rain falling down and the grass and the flowers blooming and popping up in the spring. But then in a way, I also saw it on a more spiritual le level where in that time, the righteousness is raining down on us and our is it possible that our Ruach just ignites in flames more than ever before in these in times where we're going to need that strength in those enduring moments? And it's just so important to be prepared because those are going to be challenging times. And I feel like if you're not already firmly grounded on his foundation, it's going to be maybe earth shattering. You're absolutely right. As, as, as the events of the world seem to be more and more chaotic, you know, uh, isn't, isn't it interesting, you know, this, the terminology of Shalom, right? Can we find peace in the midst of chaos? Right. Mm -hmm. And we can only do that through Yahusha. We can't find peace in our own. We can't find it in the world. We can't find it anywhere except for in him, you know, because he has the ability to give us that shalom. Even when the world is saying this or that or the other things or, or, or events in your life are happening or, or sickness or disease or whatever comes upon you. Can, can we find that shalom? You know, can we, can we find that peace? So go ahead, uh, Lois. You know, when you said that, you were, it reminded me of what James had just said about his first uh, uh, Pesach, where he was protected in his house, mm -hmm. albeit, but I mean, and it just broke loose all around him. And that's the piece, that's a picture of the peace in the midst of a storm. And it will also be the picture in the end time when we are protected through the book of Revelation. It's the same picture. We see that, that the woman is protected for periods of like about 42 months, just two reckonings to it, uh, but uh, she would be protected. So the storm, the, 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 the trumpets and the bulls could be going off all around them, but they're gonna have the same picture as James had. And we can have that assurity in our lives because we are, we see his word and his word is true. And he said, if you hide his word in your heart, you will not sin against him. You will not walk away you will stay firmly planted on the rock. Right. I think of the passage, Yahweh is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and are saved, right? And that's that's this picture, strong tower. It's immovable. You know, it's that safe place. And, and you know, and, and the best, I, I guess I think the, how do I word this? Um, uh, it's It's one thing to be known by Yah, it's another, or it's one thing to know Yah, it's another thing to be known by him. So that's the, that's this, I think, important aspect. We need to have that relationship with his son, Yahusha, in order to find that peace, in order to be in, in, in the, in the protection of his, of his tower, to be protected under his wings, as it says, right? So anyway. Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that the veil was torn in the tabernacle, ripped down forever by the gift of Messiah when he laid his life down. So there's no longer that separation from our father. He opened that door, that doorway to the father. And we know that for many people, years you know that's why they were offering these sacrifices to make atonement for their sins but now he was that ultimate sacrifice yeah go ahead chris 
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. So I was just, you know, when Lois was speaking and she was talking about um, the, how can I say, the strength, the strength of this tabernacle, you know, and um, in First Kings, I don't know if I'm if I'm going ahead or so sorry about that if I am. But in First Kings uh, chapter eight, it's talking about uh, Solomon building building the temple, mm -hmm. and then he builds this temple. And verse thirty three it says, "When your people Yeshurel be smitten down before their enemy, because they have sinned against you." That's that's a remarkable thing, right? Because they are sinned against you, they will be smitten down. And you shall and, and sorry, sorry. No. And yeah. shall turn and against shall. I think uh, James, your speaker might be a bit loud. Um, and shall turn against you and confess it your name and pray and make supplication unto you in this house. Then hear you in heaven and forgive their sin of your people, Yasharel, and bring them again into the land which you gave unto their fathers. And it carries on at 35. When heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray towards this place and confess it your name, and turn from their sin when you afflict them. Then hear you in heaven forgive their sin for your servants and of your people, Yasharel, that you teach them the good way wherein they should walk and give rain upon your land, which you have given to your people for an inheritance. Now, if we take that and we take that to Revelation um, once again, because I think... It's sort of, you know, it's a remarkable thing that that all these scriptures just come to, together in um, in the in in the new, you know, as well. All the things in the old just sort of reveal themselves in the new, um, which is an amazing thing. But in Revel Revel Revelation eleven verse three, it says, "And I will give power unto my two witnesses." That they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two mineroth standing before Yahweh of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceeds out from their mouth and devours their enemies. And any, if any man will hurt them, they must die in this manner. Or oh, sorry, in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as oft as they will. Now, that's quite interesting because of the fact that in Revelation 3, and we're talking about the church once again, which we talked about, I think, last time, um, of Philadelphia. It says in verse 9, and I, this is, no, wait, let's, let's reverse a bit and we go from verse 8. Well, let, let's actually go from verse 7. To the angel called out of the assembly of Philadelphia, write these things, says he that is holy, that is true, and he that is the key of David, that opens and no man shuts. Now we know Solomon built the temple and he was the son of David. Um, but David had the desire in his heart to build it. Okay. And it says here that mo no man opens. Um, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door that no man can shut it. For you have little strength and have guarded eth my word and have not denied my name. Now, we know that the temple was built for the name, right? To house the name that we've just read in 1 Kings. Not, and this is verse 9 now of uh, Revelation 3. It says, Behold, I will make of them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Yahudim and are not, but do 
to lie, behold, I will make them to come worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Well, this excite. this is always sort of, I've always thought about this a bit, but today I sort of clicked it a bit because of this verse in, in first, first Kings, because he's saying, well, if these people turn towards Jerusalem and pray and confess the name of Yahweh and pray uh, for forgiveness of their sins and turn their hearts towards you, then I will cause it to rain in your place. Now it says here that they will, I will cause them to come and worship before your feet. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to worship you. But what I'm saying is that the tabernacle is moved from this building to your heart. Right? We have the ten devarim circumcised our heart. So there is a difference in us that believe, and there will be a bigger difference in us that believe closer to this time. Because I believe that the whole earth groans in the birth pangs for the revealing of the sons of man. And I think that that is the revealing of those that, that know his name and that seek his face and that have humbled themselves to the point that, that, that you have brought upon, well, you've asked here into, into this earthly vessel, which is an earthly tabernacle to, um, to do to to work his will in our lives um so we also read that that we will be changed in a blink of an eye that we will be um we will shine like the sun for instance you know things like this uh counsel you to buy me linen um the 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 pure linen right the white linen that was um that we talked about last week as well so I think all these things culminate in this thing that it's the name, it's the belief, it's the uh, for, uh, it's the repentance, obviously, and Yah does this in our hearts. Now, you know uh, that that was just a fascinating thing for me to sort of see in this, and I don't know if anybody would like to add or subtract from that. Um, what, what I thought, Chris, when you were speaking, when you took over to the um, to the um, two witnesses and the the um, uh, manifestations that they will bring forth, uh, seriously mimic the first four trumpets. If you take a look, when the first trumpet sounds, it's fire and burning, and they call down fire. And when the second trumpet sounds, there's the blood. Uh, the seas turn to blood and then there's the mention of the thirds the thirds and the thirds and I wonder if that won't happen over a course of time if these trumpets occur during those two witnesses it could be a total of a third a total of a third and the hate and like when there there were storms if you look at the fourth one it's the darkening of the sun and the darkening not totally it's not gone it's just a third of it doesn't shine well you know when you've got thick cloud you don't see much more than two thirds, if you see that of the sun, and you don't hardly see any moonlight at all. And so, as I keep, as I look at these, and the water turns bitter in the third trumpet, and if they call down, and this goes into the waters, a third of the people will really suffer as a result of these. And I can't help but see a total correlation to those first four trumpets to when those two people are on, and I also see them as. From the beginning, like when they're divided into two, I forgot the words that you said, but but they're divided into this and this. Well, I see those as like coming from the very, like from Genesis, they come through, but eventually they become two actual human beings of some type. They're beings of something because they die. So they come and they're actually, anyway, that's something I see in, in, in with the two witnesses correlating to those. Yeah. Uh that's 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 interesting first of all look i mean it says that they 
they the two golden minerals standing before Yah, right? And that, if we go back into, um, where is it written? Zechariah, hey? Where it talks about the two minerals um, on either side of the olive tree. Um, and uh, very interesting, Lois, what you said there, the third. And in the Gospel of John, in the second book, um, it says, and the third day, the third from what? The third day from Yahusha's baptism, which happened in the Gospel of John uh, chapter 1. Then you'll see that there's the third day, and it says in the chapter 2, and the third day, there was a marriage of, of uh, uh, sorry, in Kwana, of Galil, and the mother of Yahusha was there. And both Yahushua was called and his Talmudim to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Yahushua said unto them, we, that they, they have no wine. And Yahushua said unto him, woman, my hour has not come. And his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he says unto you, do it. So then there were six water pots. Interesting that he changed the water from the six water pots into wine. And if you look at the six, well, that's very prophetic of man, first of all, and then of the 6,000 years. So what happens there is, is he changes the water into wine, which is also a symbol of his blood. And water is also a symbol of baptism or birth. Now, what's interesting there is that when Yahusha's side is pierced on the cross after he's dead, after the ninth hour or during the ninth hour of daylight, that is, right, which is about six o'clock in, in our Roman way of thinking, then what comes out of his side is blood and water, but they aren't mingled. They are separate. Um, which is apparently a sign of a broken heart, first of all. And then um, a sign of the birth of the blood and water of the church or of the Kodeshim, the believers in Yahusha, by his blood, um, which is then... <laughs> Uh, this is this is this can carry on for quite some time, but the thing is, <laughs> so then that is the blood that's sprinkled upon the altar, which brings the atonement of man. But remember now that the water, you know, in other words, the baptism of Yasharel going through the sea is now changed. To the blood of Mashiach is, that is shed for us and the salvation of men. Um, so water doesn't go away for us because it's the um, obedience and uh, into, into this belief that we believe. And we are baptized in a prophetic uh, action to say to every to the world and to the demons and to the angels that we are, do believe. Okay, that's that's one thing. The second thing is that the blood of Yahusha now becomes our salvation. So he sort of, and I wouldn't say replaces, but he adds to the baptism that Yasharel took by going through the sea. Um, and then we can obviously take that to when he goes into the temple uh, later on and he kicks out the money changes and he kicks out the animals of the sacrifice because his blood is superior to the sacrifice of the goats and the and, and the um, and the sheep um, so so he says you know what get these things out of my father's house because they were making that a commerce, a thing of commerce, and they were um, stealing and cheating. And this is a house of 
prayer. So the sacrifice becomes the prayer of the Kodeshim um, who have been called by him and, uh, and, 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 and uh, sanctified, if you will, by the blood and the belief in the Messiah. Okay, so there's plenty more, but anyway, thank you. John. Yeah, well, just to kind of, I guess, carry on with that a little bit. So you, you have this picture of the wedding that he goes to, right? And it's on the third day. So, so that's this idea of two days. A day is a thousand years. So our 2,000 years are up. We come, we're coming very near to the wedding feast. We're coming to where he says in, in, in Matthew 26, uh, uh, but I tell you, this is, this is uh, when he's having uh, the meal with his disciples. But I tell you, from this moment, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it in a new way in my father's kingdom with you. And that's exactly what he's talking about there. When, So it's, my time isn't yet because his time for sacrifice wasn't there. But he still paints the picture of the wedding that he's going to share with us. This feast that he desires to have with us. Right? And and we could go down a whole other uh, rabbit trail of all the other stuff but this is this is this beautiful picture of of what's to come right and and kind of bringing us back to the leviticus aspect of this is this was a shadow picture of what was to come and i i think that's kind of what we're touching on here is is the future event but it's it it all began at some point in the past and so we see yahusha like like james said earlier Yahusha is everywhere in the Old Testament, right? Uh, uh, they always, uh, my mentor always said uh, he was, Yahusha is in the Old Testament concealed, the New Testament revealed. And that's, that is exactly right. So go ahead, Lois. Well, what I, what clicked when you were saying that was the, the next picture. So I believe that's the millennial reign you're talking about. And so the next picture is that we or maybe not the next but a, a, a next picture could be is where there's 10 virgins and five go in and five are not so what if that's at the end of the millennium after the dragon is released and so then we see a picture of the division where the five go into eternity so it's talking about those that go into eternity and those that do not make it even though they know his name even though they've been going through that i believe they're the tears but i don't you know anyways that was just a thought i wondered when i listened to what you said i don't think they're the yeah, tears keep... sorry i don't think they're the tears because they are waiting for the messiah to come and the tears are are stiff-necked i mean they don't they don't produce any fruits fruits of the spirit so ruach so um, yeah, I don't think those other five virgins are tares. I think that they are also waiting for the Messiah to return. But you know, there's there's a place in Scripture, and I wish I knew it, where it says that the oil, your name is as the oil. Yeah. Now that's Song of Song, Song of Songs, uh, one verse two. Yeah, and I I think you know along with what goes along with the name is the feasts, the covenant, the Shabbats, um, you know, and, and there are a lot of Christian churches out there. They, they don't have the name they're getting, some of them are getting them, but they don't have the name. They don't have the feast. They don't have the covenant. These are the foolish virgins. They're still waiting for I, him I, to return. Yeah. I, I tend to agree with you, uh, Sherry, not that I uh, want to boast in any way, um, but uh, we, we see the um, denial of the mainstream um, church, if you will, who's actually denying uh, Yahusha and striking through the name, I believe, by uh, denying, first of all, the Tendiburi, because Yahusha himself 
is the is is the ten devil, right? I mean, you cannot deny that. He, he well, you should not deny that he is the Word made flesh, and the Word is the Word uh, that is given from heaven. Um, you know, there's only two times he sort of gave things from heaven, and the first time was to Moshe, and the second time was uh, when he was baptized, Yahushua was baptized, and then the voice of heaven came down and, and people heard it audibly. Um, so I think there's undeniable evidence that Yahushua, first of all, gave the Ten Commandments, but also is the Ten Commandments. And it's, a, it's, a, it, and, and, and it's interesting that he shows Moshe his character well, Moshe prophesies his character as he's passing him in the cleft of the rock. Um, so uh, that's one thing. Um, so what I was what I was what I was saying is, I think the ten the ten the ten foolish ones are those that deny who he is. You know, there isn't such a thing, I believe that we can just carry on as if we want to just because we have accepted um, and we've made the son and sinner's prayer and all of a sudden um, we are now belonging to somebody but we can carry on the way we did before. And this is visible in the church today that there's no difference between the church people and the outside world, i.e. with divorce, with uh, with uh, felonies, um, very much similar. So um, there there cannot be a similarity between us and the outside world. Uh, or you know, when I say outside world, I mean people who don't believe. Um, there has to be a change. There has to be a separation. There has to be something that is um, holy. Because he is hope. So, um, yeah, interesting thoughts. James, I'll hand it over to you. I think it was last Shabbat that you, Chris, and John brought up just the idea of knowing the name, but does he, does our father know our name? And I keep I look I keep looking at this comment in the chat from Gabriella. Many are called, but few are chosen. You know, and that really opened up a whole nother level of understanding for me to that verse. You know, Adonai, Adonai, we haven't we done all these wonderful things in your name? But essentially, he says, "Depart from me, I never knew you." And you know, we know this path is narrow. We know that there's millions and billions of believers out there. How can that be a narrow path? And I think it really falls down to the Sabbath and the feast days. That's how we are chosen. That's how he chooses us. Yes, all those other believers and followers, they know of him. But he doesn't know them because he they are not choosing his set apart days and commandments and it just that has really impacted me ever since you guys broke that down last week it's it's really opened up a lot of ideas and thoughts in my mind so i'm i'm just loving that idea and chris while or uh james while there's billions of people or believers or whatever still the narrow path is an individual path just like it is in in uh, uh, the Church of Laodicea. He stands at the door and knocks. He who hears my voice will come out, right? They will come in and eat with him. It's He's calling out individuals out of the mass, right, to the narrow path. And there's, I mean, we... I don't know. I think sometimes we're we're maybe casting judgment in a position that's not ours to cast judgment on because they're, you know, maybe they don't have the name yet. Maybe they haven't come to the full understanding of, of keeping the Shabbat. I think I think we're uh, going to see the 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 massive uh, 
uh, group that comes in at the last hour. I still think we're waiting for that day. I think he started the, the latter day rain ba began back in 2008, but I think it's the parable of the worker in the vineyard. And still he goes at the last hour and says, what are you guys doing standing here? Go in and go to work. Now, do they get everything figured out at the last second? No, not like the ones who did it first. And so then our attitude with those people who come in at last shouldn't be like the attitude of the ones who worked all day in the field and said, oh, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to get more. No, the reward in scripture is singular. It's not a uh, 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 multi, uh, whatever you want to call it, faceted or whatever. I think it's singular. It's, it's getting to spend time with Yahushua. There may be a specific seating order, but I, I I don't know how that works. That's a different parable. But so I think we need to be careful when we're because and I'm I'm talking to myself here because it's easy when when we move from one position to another to then think, well, everyone should be where I'm at. Well, where I was five years ago and where I was 10 years ago is not where I am today. And so it's it's an awesome thing that we have this group of believers. That's on on the path of hey wait a minute i'm willing to change i'm willing to adjust you know my favorite verse philippians 3 16 live up to whatever truth you have attained and that i think is a very important aspect of our walk so sorry i just had to jump in and and we need to be careful not to if they are the little ones or the younger ones and we we need to be careful not to hurt them because they are trying to, to, to grow, to learn. And we need to be encouraging them. If we're the more mature, we need to be really encouraging. So I agree, John, we need to be really careful on using a broad label like church. It's just too broad to use. I mean, I can see wickedness in the body. I can see it in individuals. I can see it in the whole body. But I, I, I hate to just say the whole body's wicked because I wouldn't want them to say that about us Torah observant people, that because there's one group that's gone this way, that all of us are now, you know, a cult or something. So we, we need to be really careful. We just need to be really careful. All right. And, and last week, Heather, uh, I don't remember the exact passage. It was in Matthew Verse 41, I just don't remember what chapter it was. It was speaking about the little children, right? And so in that context, it was the new believer. It was that young child. And, and it was, it's, it's important when we're looking at things, make sure we get the right context. And, and these young, like you're saying, Lois, these young people, they're new. They're coming in. They're just trying to learn, you know? And if we jump down their throats, oh, you got to go this way, you got to go that way. Well, if somebody would have done that when I first came into this walk, I probably would have just gone to La La Land, right? You know, because it's important for us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. I can't work out yours, Lois, right? And you can't work out mine. We all have to do it. And we're all in a different place where we're at in our walk. Our, all of our journeys are the same. We're all trying to, 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 to be on the right path. But but sometimes we're in a different position. So anyway, our destination is the same, John. Yes, the destination our path is different. We're going all to that same destination, and right. how we get there is going to be different. But and I'm not saying there's multiple religions or all mm -hmm. gods, and I'm not talking. That's not what I'm talking. I'm talking about the one and only Yah. We're just on a different road to get to Him, a learning way. All right. There's another passage that says uh, not to judge your your fellow servant, your fellow uh, person, right? Because Yah is able to make him stand. Yahusha can make him stand. I can't remember exactly where it is. There's probably somebody else that knows right where it is. But he can make him stand. Can't stand on his own, but Yahusha can make him stand. So, anyway. yeah, I think I think that's very important, John. That that uh, we we. Um, it's Yah's work, right? It's his. It's his people, not our people. We don't. We, you know, just because maybe Yah blesses us and more people join our group, 
doesn't mean that it's our group. It's his group. It's his people. And um, if we think that we're going to be rulers, or if we think that we're going to be teachers of people and they fall under us, that's a big mistake to make. Because Yah is the teacher. There's only one teacher. And, um, and in that last hour, uh, they get the same wage. And that mean, to me, that means that there's the same grace and mercy given to those that come in last and to those that have worked for many, many years doing the things of Yah on this earth. And, and that's, that in itself is a very difficult place for a lot of people because jealousy and, um, well, put it this way, the myth fruits of the anti-Ruach um, come in and um, they're not part of Yah. And, uh, and then we want to uh, throw stones, and that's what we shouldn't do. Okay, interesting um, here in the Gospel of John, in verse 4, we have the woman in the well. And um, there's another interesting little thing that I saw here today, which I haven't sort of seen before. Well, I haven't really taken notice before. And it says, uh, Now Jacob's well was there, and Yosha, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. Now, here's another six. And what inter what's interesting about this is, that the sixth hour is the same hour as he died. And the sixth hour is, uh, no, sorry, that it went dark when he was hanging on the cross, right? He was hanging there from the ninth hour, um, from the, th from the thir uh, third hour to the ninth hour. But on the sixth hour, it became dark. And here we have water which is related to um, related to the living water, which he says here, right? Which is the Ruach. But he said, you know, I will give you water that you know nothing of, um, that when you drink, you will not thirst again. So it's interesting that we have this water, which is baptism, and then it's the blood of Yahushua, which is actually the culmination of the, the, um, the death of Messiah, if you will, on the, on, on the ninth hour. Because it's his blood that was shed for the iniquity of us all. Um, and then here on the, uh, at the sixth hour, when there was darkness on the face of the earth for three hours until the ninth hour, that, um, that he says, you know, he, he meets this woman, and then he tells her all these things, and then um, he promises her uh, everlasting life. And then he also says, um, he know not what he worship, right? And that's... Uh, 22, he worshiped, no, he worshiped, he worshiped, he know not what. We know what we worship, for Yeshua is of the Yahudim. Well, the salvation is of the Jews. Why? Because he was a Jew. Right? Yahusha was of the Yahudim. So the salvation didn't belong to the Yahudim, but he was a Yahudim. And he brought salvation. But the hour comes and now is when true worshippers shall worship the Father in Ruach and in truth. 
for the Father seeks such to worship him. So it's an it's 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 that way what what uh, what we what we have been discussing in a little bit here is the fact that how do we worship? You know, John. I mean, you and I did that one show where it says the the way we worship or the how we worship determines the who we worship. And I mean, that was a that was a great. Um, sort of study because it sort of goes into these topics that are quite um, interesting to, to, to research. I don't know if you've got something to say there, John. Well, no, it was, it was a very powerful, um, I, I mean, I did a lot of research into it and, and it, I think it is important to understand that, that fact right the way we worship are determines the who we worship are are we worshiping on the shabbat which was probably one of the the main ones but not the only one it it boiled right down into the understanding of what worship is it's what you bow your head down to what you bow Amen. down to so so are, are you sitting there on your phone oh i did that just a bit but right we can bow down right? The Christmas tree, you bow down to get the gift out of it. There's all different kinds of aspects of just bowing down, right? Mm. And, and then who are who are we subservient to? Are we willing to be obedient to the, to the, to the master who bought us? Or are we one who wants to um, set our own uh, life aside or, or, or uh, basically have the the uh, smorgasbord Christianity is how I've looked at it. You you just pick and choose the verses that you want to adhere to, and the rest of it you just well that that's not what it means to me, right? We heard I've heard that I don't know how many times when you're trying to share about different passages. Well, I, it doesn't make any difference what it means to you or what it means to me. This is what it says. Either that's we it. learn what it says and we adhere to it, or we don't. And I think that goes back to being on that narrow path. That goes back to whether or not he knows us. It's one thing to be known by him. So I think all of those enter into this narrow path that we're all trying to seek and all trying to uh, uh, work our way down, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and I mean, uh, that also comes back to, you know, uh, Ba'ali, Ba'ali. Right. You know, Adonai, Adonai. Lord, Lord. Right. Right. Haven't right. I done this in your name? That in your name? Right. Well, that is somebody who who thinks that they know him. Right. Right. right? right. So we can have a misconception, maybe. I'm just saying, maybe, in our heads, that we are worshiping the Yah of heaven, and meanwhile, we do not know who we worship. And exactly. such is the deception. Such is the deception, you know. Um, there's a scripture which says, uh, in the, in the parable of the of the, uh, the the light and the bushel, where it says, you know, if your light be the so dark, how dark is that darkness? Mm -hmm. Right. So exactly. It's like that is a scary thought. However, we are down to four minutes left, so I actually think we're going to have to uh, say Shabbat Shalom, y'all, and uh, Gabriella, do you want to close us out here? Shabbat Shalom. Please, John. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming, and let's say uh, uh, a quick word of prayer and... and uh, Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this this time together. We thank you for your word, and and uh, we thank you that uh, even though we're all on a different journey or on a different path or or however you want to word it, Father, our destination, as Lois said, is is to come before you, to humble ourselves before you, to call upon you as our Master, as our Savior, Yahusha Hamashiach. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. 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 Shabbat shalom, everyone. 
Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.